to make fast measurements of systems and get rather complete data has really been propelled first by the development of the Tribrid Orbitrap system, and most recently with the Orbitrap Astral system. And the amount of depth and speed we can get is really unprecedented. Welcome to Science with a Twist, a podcast for curious people who enjoy exploring how science impacts our daily lives. From technology that helps the fight against COVID-19 to solutions that help clean the water we drink is all thanks to science. In each episode, members of Thermo Fisher's scientific team talk to experts who are on the cutting edge of redefining how we exist. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to Science with a Twist, brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader in serving science. My name is Rosie Lee, and I'm the VPGM of the Life Sciences Mass Spectrometry Business Unit at Thermo Fisher. We're focused on developing mass spectrometry technologies such as Orbitrap and Astral to help our customers, scientists like our guests today, study molecules like proteins and metabolites in order to gain insights into biology. I'm excited to welcome Joshua J. Kuhn, a chemistry and biomolecular chemistry professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and founder of the Kuhn Laboratories. Professor Kuhn's laboratory has been a leader in the development of mass spectrometry technology, as well as a leader in the applications of the technology towards advancing biomedical research. Today, we're going to learn about Professor Joshua Kuhn's research and how increasing our understanding of the molecular mechanism of disease can help with things like better drug design and ultimately lead to improved human health. Hi, Professor Kuhn. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Rosie. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to learning more about your cutting edge as right research as well as the rest of our audience. So just to get started, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what pushed you into the type of research that you're focused on today? Well, thanks for having me again. And so my background is I grew up in in rural Michigan. And I've always been interested in science, but I also like to build things like into woodworking, that sort of thing. And I got into mass spectrometry because it's a, an area of science where you can not only apply chemistry and learn a lot about biology, as you mentioned, but you get to work on instruments and you get to build them and, and, and change how they work. And so that's what really drew me to the field of mass spectrometry and chemistry. So I went, I got a PhD at University of Florida. I did a, a postdoc study at, at University of Virginia, and I started my group here at Wisconsin several years ago, and it's been great. I know, and I, I, I know that in our conversations, I've heard a lot about the, just the, the number of graduate students who've come out of your lab and the number of postdocs and the folks that have come out of your labs and are going off and doing great science in their own right. So it's, I'm sure that's been an exciting journey. It's been great. Yeah. What's one of the reasons I, I like to be at a university is because we get to do great research, but we also get to train the next generation of scientists. So I'm really proud we've produced about 40 PhD students from my lab and, and at least a dozen postdocs have studied here. And they're all over the world solving cool problems. I think that's one of the great things about building instruments and working with instruments is that if you have a, a technological discovery or you you help train a student, then your impact can be much bigger because those people and those things are used uh, are used by others for the things and the people are solving cool problems on their own. And so the, it's really rewarding to see the students leave here and, and go on to really neat careers. You know, and I'll, I'll bet just as you're a scientific hero for some of the undergraduates and graduate students who are going through your lab, can you tell me a little bit about some of your scientific heroes? Oh, sure. Yeah, I tell all my students that, you know, there's multiple ways to one can be a great scientist. And I think if you if you think about Einstein, who's really a remarkable person, I know I personally don't relate well to that because I don't view myself I'm not a genius, right? I can't I'm not I don't I can't think the way that that, that he does or many of the great physicists. And I say, you know, that's okay. You can still have an impact on science. So I I kind of think of Edison as a hero because, well, maybe he's not the greatest person in the world, but as a scientist, he was 
someone who worked really hard and was driven and, you know, worked around the clock and not saying that you have to do that. But the point is that you don't necessarily have to be a genius to be an important and impactful scientist. You just need to really want to, to have, you have to have a drive and a push. So I, I tell the students that it takes, you know, all different types of people can be impactful. And in my own world, I view myself as more closely aligning with the Edison model than the, than the Einstein model makes sense to me. It's that balance of inspiration and perspiration, right? Exactly. Yes. So thanks, thanks for giving us a little bit of a background on yourself. Now I'd like to just turn to the work that you're doing in your labs. Can you tell me about your research and some of the exciting things that you're doing? Sure. So we are interested in, in as we mentioned, mass spectrometer, mass spectrometer technology, and how we can use that technology to answer important biological questions. And just uh, as a bit of a background, if if the listeners don't don't know about mass spectrometry, it's it's kind of simple. Let's just think of a of a device that can instead of weighing objects, it weighs molecules. And by weighing a molecule, we can learn a lot about that molecule. It's really it's really amazing. You can learn about what the molecule is. You can learn about how much of the molecule is present, and you can often learn about structurally how it's put together. And so from a very simple idea, weighing something, you can, you can do lots of really incredible things. So in our world, we're interested in studying biological systems. And as you mentioned, interested in disease, and we can talk about that a bit later, but from a most basic level, we really want to take a complex system like a cell or maybe more complex, a, a group of cells in a tissue, say a biological, tissue, maybe a brain tissue or liver tissue. And from that cell, we'd like to extract the molecules and then figure out which ones are there and how much of them. And using mass spectrometry, we can do this really effectively. So just imagine within an hour or two of measurement, we can measure the abundance and the identity of over 10,000 molecules in a sample. Now imagine scaling that and looking at samples from different backgrounds or imagine different human subjects we can look at how genetic backgrounds and how lifestyle backgrounds can impact what's going on at a molecular level in an organism. And then we can use that to help understand what goes wrong in a disease, if that makes sense. Uh, that completely makes sense. It's amazing how uh, just understanding a little bit of information gives you a lot of insights. So exactly. you gave a really great uh understanding of what mass spectrometry is and something I think everyone can understand. So now that we understand that a little bit, can you tell me a little bit about how you're applying this technology where you're weighing proteins, for example, or lipids or anything else, and how you're applying that uh, towards biology? Sure. I'll give you a couple of recent examples of work we've done with mass spectrometry. So in one study, we um, really want to understand how a specific set of proteins function. So there's a lot of different, uh, your genome codes for many different proteins. And a lot of these proteins, these are the workhorse molecules in the cell. We don't know what they do. We, we know that they're present, but we don't know what their role is. And many diseases that are unresolved, or we, we don't, for example, met, met, metabolism disorders, many of these disorders, we don't really know the underlying we have no cures, no treatments, because we don't even know what's going on. So in one project, we said, okay, we'll take all of these proteins that we don't really know what they do, but we know they're involved in metabolism, and specifically they're in mitochondria of cells. And we're going to design a whole bunch of different cells that each one of them is missing a different one of these proteins. And then we take our mass spectrometer, and we measure all of the metabolites and the proteins and the lipids, and then from those measurements, we can compare across to all the different cell lines that we've made. And then we can determine, well, when we take away this protein, it changes the, 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 the amount of all these other molecules in this one direction. And oh, if we take away a protein that we know what it does, and, and these ones also go in the same direction, then we can infer that there's a relationship between the thing we know and the thing we don't know. And we can actually start to understand how what a protein does or its function. And we did that on a large scale and we were able to map several different proteins to a, that we didn't know what they do, 
to a new to a function. And then for several of those, we were able to then say, okay, well, if there's something wrong with this protein, does, does that cause a human disorder? And we were able to link those proteins to several different actual known human disorders and connect it to unresolved diseases in humans. And so that's laying the foundation now to potential therapies, because now we know if you have this problem, this is the protein that causes it. And, and now we have something we can target with drugs. So that's one example. Another is sort of more basic uh, that we recently did. And that is that when a protein gets made, it can be modified in lots of different ways. And this is the process that is likely behind the why mammals and humans are, are much more complex than simple organisms. We have comparable number of genes because proteins can be modified. And we were able to globally map how these modifications happen and for the first time confirm that 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 the, these changes that get made actually do go into the proteins and they're making a difference. So that's another example. I'll stop there because I'm not sure my second example was any good and maybe I should start over. What- <laughs> no, the, I, I think it's I think it's a great example and a really nice way to explain why, you know, different species, even though they have the same number of genes, might look really different between a cell and, and, and a mammal, as you point out. Are there specific diseases where your work is particularly applicable? Oh, sure. So I mentioned uh, the earlier example of the mitochondrial or, or metabolism uh, disorders is one area that we're focused on, sort of un- un- unresolved uh, mitochondrial disorders is a broad term. But we're also studying things that are more well-known, for, for example, uh, Alzheimer's and dementias. We're, we're working with folks on uh, diabetes-related projects. And then, of course, we've got several collaborations involving various types of cancers. And I'll just give you an example for the Alzheimer's and dementia. One of the, one of the key things that we're trying to use these mass spectrometers, which basically weigh things, right, and is to try to understand what are the things that happen in a human well before you have symptoms of dementia? And, and the idea is that if we can figure out molecular signatures of the disease before it's obvious, we might be able to slow the progression. And I know it's a very exciting time in Alzheimer's research because there's actually two, F, at least one, I think soon to be two FDA approved therapeutics to, to slow dementia. But now the key is to identify those people that can benefit from that therapy. So our, one of our projects is to take plasma and cerebral spinal fluid from subjects and look for markers that are uh, very low level, but, but, but diagnostic potentially of the disease so that we could screen people. Obviously, we'd rather do that in plasma. So that's where we're focusing most of our efforts. And th- that's great. Do you think that potentially leads to a therapy or a diagnostic or where do you think this research goes from here? For the Alzheimer's example, it's, it would be ideally diagnostic so that you would, we would know if these molecules are present at some amount, then that's an indication that this person is, is going to be having suffering from AD at some point in the future before we'd even know or be able to tell that by, say, brain imaging. And then those folks would then, you, you would get screened for that. So that, that's one outcome. Now, for the other types of projects, like some of the cancer-related projects, we're really looking at a more fundamental, basic level. So, for example, when you get a cancer that's basically like cells are growing unchecked, and that's really the hallmark of cancer. And we're we're working with several researchers to try to understand, well, better understand how the, the cancer cell can evade all of the checkpoints that are normally there and keep growing. And part of that is to really understand at the protein level, what's changing and what are the mutations that are happening that are allowing that to occur. So really molecular level detail. We can get that with the mass spectrometer. And so we're interested in in helping really pin down uh, specific events that are happening, when they're happening and where they're happening so that that can lead to just better mechanistic understanding, but also potential therapeutics. So proteins that would be targets for intervention for therapeutic targets. So the goal there is to identify targets for therapeutics, whereas the goal with the AD research is to help diagnostic. So you can really span that spectrum with this tool. 
Uh, I think that's great. And so I guess even though there's amazing things that we can do today with mass spectrometry, I'm curious, are there innovations uh, that um, mass spectrometry can unlock or that previously wasn't possible? Sure. Well, I think that um, these types of measurements, they we've only been able to do them for the past decade or so. And then with every year, as the technology improves, we get better and better and we can see more and more. So it's like, it's a lot like if you're into astronomy, being able to have better telescopes to look at the night sky. And, you know, when several hundred years ago, we, we had no idea how big even our own solar system was, let alone other galaxies. And as the, as the, micros or the, the telescopes get big, better, we're able to really map where we are in the universe and how we fit in. And I think much of this is very similar with the mass spectrometry technology, except now we're looking within the cell and we're understanding these myriad interactions that happen. And we're understanding how they go off the rails in, in disease and, and potentially how to get them back. And so I think the technology is, is, is it continues to get better, we're going to be able to see more things and we're going to be able to learn more and more detailed information, higher resolution about how these things all fit together. It's a lot like astronomy, but for the inverse, I guess you could say. Uh, and, and definitely the ability to see finer and finer differences, I would imagine, is going to be impactful as well. Yeah, and I, I think for us, so we may have looked at a particular type of sample 10 years ago and now and, and maybe we found one thing of interest but now it's like okay well we can see 10 times more protein with the mass spectrometers they're so much better so we got to go back and do the same experiment again and we find more things so it's like pulling back multiple layers of an onion and we're yeah. now really able to do that much better and i think there's more to pull back but we're able to see more than we ever have so I know your lab and your work, you've been on the cutting edge of mass spectrometry, technology development and innovation. What's exciting you and your team about what it, the future holds? Well, I've, I've sort of uh, tipped my hand and given a lot of that away already, but I, I guess the, our, the ability we now have to, to make fast measurements of systems and get rather complete data has really been propelled first by the development of the, of the Tribrid Orbitrap system and, and most recently with the, with the Orbitrap Astral system. And the, the amount of depth and speed we can get is really unprecedented. And so we're so excited about, about how much more we can detect and how much more quick, quickly we can do that with the Astral system. So that's what our focus is right now. How can we leverage that new uh, system to see more? That's one thing. And then a uh, broader picture uh, I think the intersection of mass spectrometry and structural biology, so that would be worlds of electron microscopy, is really changing how we yeah. think about things and how we do things. And I see a lot of synergy with those technologies, both for measuring what's there, but then understanding the structure of the thing that we did detect. So I think it's just our ability to make measurements globally and large scale it just keeps getting better. That's what excites me. Uh, that's awesome, Josh. And I, I know that you, uh, your work in your lab where you're actually looking at the intersection of mass spectrometry and cryo EM has been really exciting for us here at the company. So thank you for that. I'm oh, sure. So I, I'd like to thank our guest, Professor Kuhn, for his time today and sharing some fascinating insights on why the structure of proteins and the weighing of proteins holds promise for a future in health discovery and biology. Until next time, this is Science with a Twist. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Science with a Twist. This show is brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader in serving science. If you enjoyed this episode, then follow Science with a Twist wherever you get your favorite podcasts.